I'm Ashton Addison from BlockWest Capital for Investment Pitch Media and the Crypto Coin Show. And today on Blockchain Interviews, we have Warren Paul Anderson, the VP of Product at Discrete Labs, the team behind Fendora. Warren, welcome to the show and thank you for taking the time to come on. Thanks a lot for having me, Ashton. Excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to dive into this discussion. I first spoke with Fendora over a year ago and I know your team has been working on quite a lot uh, in the year, a year and a half really, uh, since we last spoke. I would love to get the viewers up to speed by just getting an overview and a high level solutions of what Fendora is working on and what the team at Discrete Labs is focused on with Fendora. Yeah, sure. So uh, Fendora is, you know, layer one blockchain with uh, programmable privacy. Uh, one of the teams that's working on is Discrete Labs. Discrete Labs has actually grown to over 60 people um, based in both North America and Asia. <clears throat> and Discrete Labs kind of maintains uh, a lot of the, the code base related to to Fendora uh, uh, using the programmable privacy and, and how we use programmable privacy, we'll probably get into it in a little bit, but uh, we basically use a few different technologies, one called uh, zero knowledge proofs and, and the other called multi-party computation. And these are kind of mm -hmm. fringe technologies that have uh, found their way into the blockchain space. And we uh, anticipate them being used a lot more to do things like, uh, you know, preserve privacy for users. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And yeah, I have heard of both of those, but most of the time, you know, people just hear zero knowledge proofs and they just think, okay, zero knowledge, like it must be good. You know, I don't really know about the, the intricacies of, and, and sometimes you don't need to know exactly how, but it's great to get, uh, you know, sort of a high level. Uh, I would love, you know, if you could talk a little bit about the problems in, in blockchain right now and in preserving privacy and identity management in why technologies like uh, zero knowledge proofs and, and secure MPC are needed, you know, in the way that blockchains currently run, uh, is people are, are people's information really vulnerable to uh, hackers and, and just public blockchain information? Or like, why is that technology necessary to bring in with Fendora? Yeah, something we've identified, you know, some privacy issues <clears throat> in the in the blockchain space, but also they kind of apply to, you know, all of uh, uh, the digital economy that's growing, um, you know, and uh, there's pr three particular problems in, in blockchain. One was a user privacy problem. <clears throat> so we are seeing, you know, lots and lots of, uh, you know, these transactions are, that are on uh, some of these blockchains are actually, they're not anonymous, they're actually semi-anonymous and what they call pseudo-anonymous. Uh, and they're becoming less anonymous, you know, as, as time goes on. So as people, uh, you know, create more exchange accounts, they leave their identity information through a process called KYC or know your customer. That's effectively like putting a fingerprint on the blockchain, right? The more times they do that, the more fingerprints they leave. So, uh, and, and that's okay if, you know, that information is in the hands of the right people, but it's not okay if it gets in the hands of the wrong people. So definitely there's going to be uh, continued user privacy issues um, because these transactions are radically transparent. Uh, mm -hmm. Another one is actually <clears throat> more along the lines of um, uh, a liquidity issue. So, you know, because these uh, transactions are so uh, transparent, uh, what we're seeing is a lot of the institutional capital that's, uh, you know, sitting on Wall Street. We're talking in the order of, you know, trillions of dollars, uh, you know, that's just trading, you know, throughout the day uh, is actually kind of sitting on the sidelines because they want to enter into this space, but they don't want to reveal the, you know, competitive intelligence that, uh, that you know, they protect uh, by, by banking, you know, with uh, regular, you know, fin traditional financial institutions. Mm -hmm. um, it's not great that a competitor, you know, knows your bank balance or knows your, your crypto balance, right? And everyone knows, you know, that Tesla bought $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin. But everyone's also going to know when Tesla sells $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin. So, you know, with transparency comes, you know, concerns around privacy and, you know, actual competitive intelligence that, that gets revealed. So those are those are two really big problems that, that we found. Um, and they're not going to get any better as, as, you know, crypto becomes more mainstream. These problems become, you know, more ubiquitous 
And uh, so really we wanted to build something, you know, using zero knowledge proofs that we could actually help preserve the privacy without, uh, you know, uh, reducing the, the actual integrity of the core blockchain. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And yeah, it's, it's funny how, you know, retail investors, they just, they're not so concerned about, uh, you know, they're more concerned about, you know, what price that I buy Bitcoin at. And, and then when large institutions come in, uh, with trillions of dollars, there's so many more variables of like, you know, who's going to know when we bought this, what, what, at what time should we buy it? Where should we move the money from? Where should we store it? And with fully decentralized public blockchains, you know, that can all be seen if, uh, they see the transaction of where they bought it, then you can see their balance. And if they move it, uh, you know, there's all these whale alert platforms and, and tracking for blockchain explorers. You can easily see if Tesla starts moving that money before they put out a press release, you know, the second it happens, you can get a notification. Um, so obviously there are uh, some things needed for these large institutions and just for general privacy as well um, to be able to, you know, sort of protect some of that information. And you mentioned there's zero knowledge proofs. Can, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what exactly does zero knowledge proofs do? And if you are a large institution that's going to make a big purchase or try to hide information, how exactly does zero knowledge proofs help with that? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so zero knowledge proofs are something that were invented actually several decades ago. It's a, it's a cryptographic method that allows you to effectively share information without actually showing it. And so we call it kind of sharing without showing. Um, <clears throat> and concretely what that means is, you know, if I wanted to prove to you that I was, um, you know, over the age of 21, typically in the real world, I'd have to just show you my ID and you look at my ID, but then you also see where I live. You see, um, you know, my, all the other information that's on that ID that isn't relevant to my age. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, with the zero knowledge proof, actually what I can do is, is just show you a proof that uh, that I'm actually over tw uh, 21 or over, and and you can compute that proof, verify that proof, and then we know that that's that's a that's a that's a legitimate uh, statement that that I'm over 21. And what's nice about that is that I actually don't have to reveal my actual age. Mm -hmm. I only have to reveal that I'm over 21. So uh, that kind of process, you know, applied to lots of different use cases in financial technology, especially is, is becoming, you know, really, really useful. So mm -hmm. they're being used now uh, to, to do a lot of um, uh, scalability, you know, on different networks by you know, basically they're compressing a lot of the, the, the blockchain data into a very succinct form and being able to show a proof that, that this is valid and then you can kind of uh, uh, verify the, the the actual information from from that proof. Um, but we're also, you know, we're uh, Discrete Labs is using uh, zero knowledge proofs, particularly for privacy. So being able to to use that same kind of technology to prove that these transactions are actually happening without actually revealing them. Mm -hmm. mm, very cool. And and I know we spoke you know quite a while ago, but I believe the platform is already in development. Can you talk about when Findora started, uh, what you've been working on and, and where you're at right now? Yeah, sure. So I joined the team in mid-March. Um, we were, uh, right then we were about to to launch uh, what we're called Mainnet Beta, which we did at the end of March. Um, <clears throat> and the the phase uh, right now is is the, 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 uh, pr the network is in is a Mainnet Beta, which we're basically, it's a, a stripped down version of, um, you know, of, of an existing, you know, network uh, has very simple uh, uh, transaction types, being able to send and receive the native token FRA, uh, both confidentially and, you know, transparently. Um, and then also you can issue tokens similar, like how you would on Ethereum uh, and create tokens actually both confidentially and transparently. So that's a pretty interesting kind of, uh, uh use case. Cause that would allow for something like, uh, stable coins and private stable coins to be issued on Fendora, um, and other types of, of assets. So, uh, that's kind of the basis right now of, of what, uh, the Fendora mainnet looks like. We have, uh, a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago, we released, um, proof of stake. Uh, staking on 
testnet. So it's running, uh, you know, the fully, you know, staking with delegation because uh, Fedora actually runs um, the Tendermint consensus. So mm. uh, we're able to inherit a lot of the robustness of the tender, t- Tendermint consensus mechanism uh, to allow for proof of stake. So on testnet, we're running uh, staking. Uh, we expect to you know, push that into mainnet in the ne- next couple of months. And then we are about to roll out actually another kind of developer network that uh, is going to have essentially the, the the latest kind of beta releases coming out that will be deployed um, on both testnet and mainnet. Wow, very cool. And it's great to hear that you can also create an ecosystem inside of Fedora, uh, create you know native assets that have that privacy preserving structure as well. Uh, that's really interesting. And I'm excited to see how that plays out. And I think the developer ecosystem is going to be uh, a great addition and something that's needed to help uh, bring more people in to help develop on your platform you know, because there's so many protocols coming out with different uh, developer developer environments and really it's about making it easy uh, for developers to, to start working uh, on Fendora. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm curious, you know, you have this full ecosystem uh, with Fendora and the ability to create tokens, uh, but f- I'm guessing that you know, I, I've spoken to the Tendermint and Cosmos team, and I know they're all about like the inner blockchain communication and, and working with other blockchains. If the if an institution is trying to buy Bitcoin or Ethereum or something that's not related uh, to the Fedora Layer One protocol specifically, does the technology pres- uh, privacy preserving does that apply to you know any kind of transactions outside of Fedora as well? It's a really good question. So um, the the vision is yes, we want to apply, uh, you know, Fedora's zero knowledge proof uh, kind of privacy preserving technology to other blockchains, uh, and that's really kind of the pillar that we're standing on with interoperability, being able to do cross chain uh, interoperability. But the 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 vision is you know uh, the execution is much more difficult than the vision, right? Because mm-hmm. <clears throat> a lot of these uh, these networks. Uh, the Fedora blockchain is a UTXO based blockchain, which mm. is lends itself better to uh, to preserving privacy because there's it's effectively a stateless you know blockchain. There's no actual state that's being stored, so you can actually you know um, uh, wrap that into a privacy preserving protocol. Uh, most of the other you know networks are becoming you know more and more stateful. So Ethereum is an account based you know network. So uh, pr- Bringing privacy to Ethereum is actually <clears throat> quite a, uh, a challenge, uh, but we're going to be releasing some things on to the developer network, you know, here in the next couple um, couple weeks that will actually lend itself kind of down that path because we think that uh, preserving privacy, you know, on Fedora first is obviously kind of the first staple, and then the next is is starting to introduce that into other networks. But it's a step by step process. It's going to involve a lot of uh, critical work on, uh, you know, the, our, our cryptographers, uh, you know, actually writing, you know, and implementing uh, different zero knowledge proofs for more complex statements mm-hmm. and uh, and <clears throat> figuring out some breakthroughs uh, on that field. Definitely. Yeah. A uh, no, big work in progress. And I know I can imagine that the Fendora ecosystem itself is already a huge task to take on in developing you know, the developer ecosystem, building out the uh, a token infrastructure to build tokens on top. Um, I'm also curious more about the FRA native token uh, that you briefly mentioned so far. Um, you mentioned that you can do staking. I'm curious on what else uh, you can do with the Fendora token and how it plays a role into the ecosystem and the protocol. Yeah, so just like most networks, you know, Fendora uh, has a native token called FRA. It's primarily used to, you know, as gas to pay fees. Um, it can also be used as the native token to to do asset transfer. Um, uh, but what's kind of unique about Fendora among the other kind of privacy uh, blockchains is that you can actually issue uh, private tokens. So um, you mentioned before, you know, that there's Twitter bots, like every time there's a movement of funds, uh, mm-hmm. when it applies to uh, stable coins, for instance, like uh, Tether or USDC, the same rule applies. Uh, every time more Tether is minted, uh, uh, some Twitter bot, you know, publishes how much that that, that is. Uh, and that's because, you know, the balances are radically transparent in Tether. 
But uh, I think most people would pr prefer that their wallet balance in, uh, in fiat currency or, or stable coin isn't revealed. Uh, so we expect to see more and more stable coins uh, start to seek out you know, these privacy blockchains to be able to issue you know, tokens and maintain a balance in a confidential way so that mm -hmm. they're protecting users' privacy. Uh, so <clears throat> that's one of the unique properties of, of Fendora as, as it relates to some of the other privacy blockchains. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And you mentioned that the full mainnet's coming up, uh, your mainnet beta is out. Can you talk about what are the major next steps that you and your team are focused on uh, towards the release of the mainnet and just towards the, uh, the end of the year? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the next few weeks, we expect, uh, you know, um, st uh, the test net to you know, reach uh, sufficient stability, you know, for the community to adopt on mainnet, <clears throat> which will include staking and delegation. Um, there's a, a whole tokenomics model that's, you know, been applied to uh, generate AP APY for stakers. Uh, and, and delegators, um, <clears throat> which will help kind of, you know, build more of the ecosystem around, um, you know, around staking. Uh, also, you know, we're going to be introducing more programmability into, into the, the network. Um, I won't say exactly which networks we're going to be uh, integrating into first, uh, but we'll just say they're, they're the bigger ones. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we expect to kind of have that kick off more of the cross chain kind of compatibility, interoperability uh, of, of different assets so that we can start to build liquidity bridges you know, into those networks um, with a follow up to eventually introduce privacy to those networks. Great to hear, Warren. And for the viewers that are looking to follow along with the release of the main net, learn more about Fundora, FRA, and get involved in the community. What's the best way for them to get involved? Uh, probably the best access point is just Fundora.org. Uh, there's a lot of information. You know, the teams are constantly updating, you know, the, the site to, to make sure it has the most relevant information. Um, and then, you know, we're on Twitter with uh, Fundora Official. Uh, so catch us there. Obviously, lots of telegrams, and then our Discord channel is growing. You know, pretty considerably. If you're a developer, you want to get involved in the project. Sounds great, Warren. I will leave all those links in the description box below as well. All the best on Findora moving forward, and let's follow up in the near future. Thanks a lot, Ashton.